Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this three-part lecture, Why White Liberals Fail. We are hoping, Tony, that they do not fail on November 6th. <laughs> but this is a three-part lecture, uh, Why White Liberals Fail, Southern Politicians and Race, 1933 to 2018. And he will be speaking today on the New Deal, the economic solution. Tony Badger is professor in American history at Northumbria University. He earned his PhD in American studies at the University of Hull. From 1971 to 1991, he served as lecturer at Newcastle University before joining the faculty of the University of Cambridge as the Paul Mellon Professor of American History and he was at Cambridge University from 1992 to, nine, to 2014 and Master of Clare College from 2003 to 2014. Tony Badger's research and teaching interests encompass post-World War II American political history, particularly Southern history. He covers race relations, the Great Depression, and the New Deal. An eminent scholar of the New Deal, he has published extensively, including such books as Prosperity Road, The New Deal, Tobacco, and North Carolina. And this was published in 1980, The New Deal, The Depression Years, 1933 to 1940, published in 1990, and FDR, The First Hundred Days, published in 2008, and this book was described by then British Prime Minister Gordon Brown, and I quote him, a classic example of how a work of history can illuminate the issues we're dealing with today. In 2007, the collection of Tony Badger's essays on history appeared in uh, the collection New Deal, New South, The Anthony Badger Reader. Forthcoming from the University of Pennsylvania, Press, Badger's most recent book, Albert Gore Senior, Senior, A Political Life, explores the life and political career of Tennessee Senator Albert Gore Senior. You know, that's the father of Vice President Gore. And the biography provides a window onto the transformations in the South leading to national political realignment. From 2009 to 2016, Badger was chair of the Kennedy Memorial Trust and since 2011, he has served as the independent reviewer for the British Foreign Office, monitoring the release of documents whose existence the Foreign Office had previously denied. In 2017, he was elected president of the Historical Association in the UK for a three-year term. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce you to Tony Badger, who again will speak on the New Deal, the economic solution. <clears throat> my, thank, my thanks to Professor Higginbotham for that very generous introduction, uh, and to Professor Gates, <coughs> who is one of Clare College's most distinguished alumni. Uh, we both, uh, as a Paul Mellon professor, uh, I'm particularly uh, grateful to uh, Professor Gates, who was the first African-American Mellon Fellow from Yale University to Clare uh, in 1971, Skip? 73. 73. Uh, and uh, he was described to me by another, an alumnus of that vintage as being the coolest man on campus. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> I want to start by asking simply the question, what is a white liberal? Uh, in 1965, Reuben Anderson, a young African-American, climbed onto a bus in Jackson, Mississippi. He sat in the front row in the knowledge that the two white men sitting in the row behind would not like it, but also in the knowledge that there was nothing they could do about it. Uh, instead of forcing Anderson to move to the back of the bus, the two men talked loudly, making as much use of the N-word as possible. And I have to say that the N-word will crop up uh, in the terms that some of these whites used it in the 1940s and 50s. 
Anderson relished the fact that they were powerless to do more than talk. Eventually, one of the whites said to the other, that William Winter is a liberal. The other asked, what is a liberal? The answer is simple and stark, a nigger lover. Now, it might make be that the, that answer makes these lectures redundant. Uh, white liberals failed in the South because the more, white majority of the South of what retained their racist views. As one racist observer put it, uh, why did Democrats lose the white South? Because the party became too liberal on civil rights and racist white Southerners didn't like it. My wife uh, unsympathetically ab observed about these lectures when she read a draft. Why would anybody want to hear about a bunch of drunken womanizing white men with long hair accompanied by country and western bands, uh, wailing white folks as she describes them. Uh, most of these men have had one family member shot by another family member. Um, but I hope to tease the subject out a little further. In 1965, William Winter, the nigger lover, was the state treasurer of Mississippi, and he would become governor of Mississippi in 1979 arguably the most successful governor in Mississippi history, although the bar is set quite low. Um, he revolutionized the provision of public education in Mississippi, providing for a quantum leap in school funding, depoliticized the state administration of schools, consolidated schools, and equalized school funding. The young men he brought in to assist him, the boys of spring, like Ray Mabus and Dick Molpus, would carry forward the liberal project in the next 20 years. Mabus would be elected governor in 1987 on the slogan, Mississippi will never be last again. Bill Clinton appointed him ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Barack Obama made him secretary of the Navy. By the time Winter left office uh, in 1983, Mississippi had more elected African-American official, officials than any state in the nation. The young man on the bus, Reuben Anderson, mentored by Winter, would sit on the Mississippi Supreme Court, become president of the Mississippi Bar Association and president of the Mississippi Economic Council. In 1996, he would co-chair with Winter the Bill Clinton for President campaign in Mississippi. Winter himself would be a forceful member of the advisory board of Bill Clinton's initiative on race. Winter epitomized the changes that transformed the South from a segregated region committed to white supremacy to a booming, white, bi booming biracial democracy. Yet when running first for the governorship in 1967, two years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, he had proclaimed, I was born a segregationist, raised a segregationist, I have always defended that position, and defend I defend it now. Today, Mississippi is a bastion of republicanism and support for Donald Trump. Only 6% of white voters in LaFleur County in the Mississippi Delta supported Lyndon Johnson in 1964. Almost half a century later, even fewer voted for Barack Obama, and they overwhelmingly supported Donald Trump. Mississippi now has a white Republican governor, two white Republican senators, three white Republican representatives, and one lone black Democratic congressman. Ever since Franklin Roosevelt declared that there was a new generation of Southerners coming forward in the South, hopes have been placed in white Southern liberals. After the war, political scientist V.O. Key predicted that the collapse of the four pillars of white supremacy in the South, segregation, black disfranchisement, the malapportionment of state legislatures, and the one-party system, the collapse of those pillars would immeasurably strengthen the forces of Southern liberalism. Later, both the justices on the Supreme Court and President John Kennedy believed that there were white moderates, white moderate leaders in Southern communities who would take their communities into peaceful compliance with the law of the land without the need for heavy-handed federal intervention. In the 1970s, pundits celebrated the rise of a new South, and praised the remarkable group of governors elected in 1970 and after. In the 1980s, the success of governors like Bill Clinton 
and the politics espoused by the Southern dominated Democratic Leadership Council seemed to herald a new era of national and Southern liberalism. But white Southern liberals and racial moderates have never been the force of the future in the South. Their failure, particularly in the 1950s and 1960s, led to scorn. African-American journalist Carl Rowan described a Southern moderate as anyone who hasn't lynched a crippled old Negro grandmother during prayer meeting hour. <laughs> Lewis Killian argued that moderates in the South surrendered to the mob before it even gathered. Martin Luther King famously lamented, first, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white right moderate. An African-American minister wryly commented to Calvin Trillin that if everybody who retrospectively claimed to have work, been working behind the scenes for racial change in the South had been working there, it would be mighty crowded backstage. A distinguished Southern historian once commented on a two-volume dissertation at this university on Mississippi white liberals by saying, one volume for each of them. <laughs> what I will argue in these lectures is that Southern white liberal politicians constantly sought to prioritize other issues than race. In the New Deal, they were convinced that, as Hugo Black put it, the core of the problem is economic. Solve the economic problem and the race problem will sort itself out. Right through to the present, they have put their faith in education and economic growth. In the 1930s and 40s, they were reluctant to contemplate the end of segregation. They were confident that they knew what African Americans wanted and that they, white Southerners, could dictate the timetable of racial change and that racial change would be gradual. Faced with the Brown decision, which called for the end of segregation, they were fatalistic. They were reluctant to campaign for meaningful compliance with the Supreme Court for fear of further arousing existing white mass racism. When it became clear that African Americans and the federal government would dictate the timetable of racial change, it was Southern business leaders and pragmatic conservative politicians, not the liberals, who mediated that change. After the Voting Rights Act, Southern white liberals or moderates did but build successful biracial coalitions. But they have been undermined by a lily-white Republican Party, the mobilization of socially and racially conservative religious evangelicals, and the economic dislocation of so many lower-income white Southerners in today's global economy. Education and economic growth have simply been insufficient to sustain the liberal project. Going back, I want to talk in this lecture about the New Deal years, and I used to argue that the New Deal left the structure of the South unchanged. In 1930, the South was a poor, rural, one-crop society in which too many people chased too little farm income. In 1940, the South was still a poor, rural, one-crop society in which too many people chased too little farm income. In 1930, the South was the bastion of the open shop. In 1940, it was still an anti-union stronghold. In 1930, the South was rigidly segregated. African Americans were economically and politically powerless. In 1940, African Americans were still economically dependent, politically impotent, and rigidly segregated. In 1930, Southern politicians uh, Southern politics were dominated by a conservative alliance of county seat elites, planters, and industrialists, largely immune to popular pressure because of their economic dominance and the restricted nature of the electorate. In 1940, these same political leaders still controlled the South. As B.O. Key noted, the have-nots continue to lose out in the region's disorganized politics. But I am now more impressed by the argument that the New Deal rescued the region's farmers, integrated the region's economy into the international economy, and presided over a welfare revolution in the South. Above all, the federal government invested the in, in the infrastructure of the South. It reclaimed the land, it established the TVA, it provided cheap power and water resource development, it rescued education, it built roads and urban public infrastructure. 
these investments would enable the region to take off into self-sustaining economic growth during World War II, when billions of dollars were pumped into the southern economy in defense plants and military facilities. By and large, white southerners welcomed this largesse. Whatever the traditional suspicion of big government and budget deficits, white southern politicians embraced the New Deal. Their constituents were so desperate for assistance that they demanded that their representatives in Congress support President Roosevelt. Herman Talmadge, future militant segregationist, son of Arch New Deal opponent Eugene Talmadge, recalled, I don't imagine you could have found a white man in Georgia that would have publicly admitted in 1932 that he was against Roosevelt. Reactionary Mississippi Congressman William Colmer, whose successor was Trent Lott, recalled the 1934 election. At that time, Roosevelt was possibly at the zenith of his career. People all over the country worshipped him, and I must confess that I was something of an admirer myself at the time, because we had to do something. I tied myself to Mr. Roosevelt. I recall I got out a chart, which I distributed, showing all the federal funds that had come out of the relief people in my congressional district. I was bragging about all the federal funds that I'd gotten for the district. We started pumping the prime, prim priming the pump, and kept priming it in good years as well as bad. Kenneth Bindas interviewed 500 rural southerners, all before, born before 1920. Their response was, quote, nearly universal adoration of Roosevelt and the New Deal. Now, one of the reasons Southern white politicians, normally so conservative, were so enthusiastic about the New Deal was that the New Deal appeared to leave white supremacy and segregation untouched. The New Deal did not challenge black disfranchisement, although liberals did push an anti-poll tax bill through the House at the start of the war, but that was largely about extending white not biracial democracy. Roosevelt refused to make federal anti-lynching legislation a must piece of legislation. The local operation of New Deal programs, either by state governments or, or by local federal officials, routinely operated on a segregated basis. Uh, African Americans found it harder to get on the relief rolls than their white counterparts, pay, were paid less both on relief and on, on federal work programs. It is eloquent testimony to the fact that the federal government was not challenging the racial status quo, that conservative Senator Pat Harrison of Mississippi was prepared to champion loudly federal aid to education. And his congressional friend, William Colmer, argued for a purely federal system of social security. Both argued uh, that a poor state like Mississippi could not afford to participate in programs which required matching money from the state and both acknowledged that Mississippi's resources were too inadequate to meet the welfare and educational needs of the time. Neither saw any danger that strings would be attached to such federal aid that would threaten white supremacy. Some of the most notorious racists in the South were ardent New Deal supporters. Theodore the Man Bilbo, the champion of the hill country whites of Mississippi, bitter enemy of the Delta planters, had an almost perfect pro-New Deal voting record in the Senate after he was elected in 1934. The most enthusiastic supporter of the TVA and rural electrification was John Rankin, congressman from Tupelo, Mississippi, and a vicious negrophobe and anti-Semite. Former Klansmen included Senator Hugo Black, one of the most clear-headed and thorough liberals in the Senate, and the two state governors who brought little New Deals to their states in the 1930s, E.D. Rivers in Georgia, Bib Graves in Alabama. Josephus Daniels, Roosevelt's mentor as Secretary of the Navy under Woodrow Wilson, Roosevelt's ambassador to Mexico, and the owner of the fervently pro-New Deal Raleigh News and Observer, Daniels still recalled in the 1930s and 40s with unapologetic pride his role in the violent white supremacy campaign in North Carolina in 1898 that had restored white rule in the state. It is customary to talk of a long civil rights movement, but economically and politically powerless African Americans in the 1930s had few levers to pull 
in order to secure redress of their grievances. As one rural African American recalled, there was nothing you could do about it. You couldn't say nothing. Another said, if they had talked out like the young do now, somebody was going to get hung. For all the president's apparent indifference to African American civil rights, blacks in the South regarded Roosevelt as their hero. Ruby Barlow remembered that whites commiserated her with her when FDR died. Yall's president is dead. And indeed, African Americans glimpsed the possibility of change in the 1930s. New Deal programs may have been discriminatory, but they, the assistance they provided surpassed what cash-strapped state governments have been able to provide in the Depression, or the federal government had indeed provided in the past. Civil rights had not been an issue for national political leaders back in the 1920s. It did not loom large in liberal discourse. But communist involvement in the Scottsboro case in 1931 raised the bar for the NAACP. It was time for the organization, as Charles Houston exhorted, to go home to the South. His Howard-trained legal van vanguard went South to exhort local African Americans to form NAACP branches, to register to vote, and to initiate teacher equalization suits, salary equalization suits. More important, Southern black leaders took from the New Deal hope for the future. They had seen the federal government intervene to transform the region's economy. Potentially, the federal government could intervene to change the region's race relations. Although that might have seemed a distant prospect in the 1930s, there were now additional levers for black leaders to pull. African Americans in northern cities had switched away from their historic loyalty to the Republicans. In 1934, African Americans in the North flocked to the Democrats in gratitude for the assistance given to the northern urban poor, administered, it in, a, administered in a relatively non-discriminatory way. That national voting clout gave some political muscle to the National Civil Rights Coalition that built up in the 1930s for the first time. New Deal liberals, organized labor, radicals, and the NAACP. Now, what uh, African Americans hoped for, Southern white conservatives feared. If there was a long civil rights movement, there was also a long massive resistance movement, which went back to the 1930s a strategy designed, as Jason Morgan Ward has so expertly delineated, a strategy designed to preempt the possibility of national interference in segregation and white supremacy. Now, from the start, there were some Southern critics of the New Deal in the Senate. Their anti-New Deal votes reflected their belief in limited government, free market economics, and a balanced budget. But this is primarily a criticism more on of the New Deal more on economic grounds than on racial grounds. More closely linked to the race were the Southern industrialists who set their sights against the efforts of the New Deal to maintain wage levels. They played the race card, the danger that white workers might have to work alongside African Americans who were getting the same wages. Classic Southern demagogues were soon whipping up racial fears. Huey Long was a notable exception. His racial moderation has been exaggerated, although it is true that Huey P. Newton's father named his son after Huey P. Long. Um, but he eschewed racial appeals in his attacks on Roosevelt. Instead, he lambasted bailouts to bankers and industrialists and the failure to redistribute wealth to his poor constituents. But Eugene Talmadge suffered no such inhibitions. Talmadge, Talmadge's power base lay in the galluses wearing farmers of Georgia, who wielded disproportionate power in the state because of the county unit system. He tapped into their resentment of the cities, particularly Atlanta, and their raw, blatant racism. He was unremitting in his scorn for the crippled president and his Negro-loving wife. He screamed about supposed racial favoritism and race mixing by New Deal agencies and his agrarian crusade was bankrolled by right-wing industrialists from both the South and the North. Mainstream Southern politicians condemned Talmadge, not because these politicians were defending 
racial change, but because they thought Talmadge was conjuring up a threat to the racial status quo that did not actually exist. In 1936, white Southern support for FDR trumped any racial fears. Both Richard Russell in Georgia and James Burns in South Carolina triumphed over white supremacy challengers in that year, in Russell's case, against Talmadge himself, and professed their undying support of the New Deal. But three developments uh, gave Southern conservatives pause about the New Deal and linked their economic concerns to racial, racial concerns. First, the shift we've mentioned of uh, African Americans in the Northern cities to the Democratic Party. Second, the abolition of the two-thirds rule at the Democratic National Convention in 1936. In the future, the South would no longer have a veto over the Democratic presidential nomination. Third, the long-term non-emergency direction of the New Deal. For many middle-class white Southerners, the economic emergency was over. Agriculture and industrial recovery had come. The danger of a revolt by the have-nots seemed to have passed. Instead, congressmen worried that New Deal programs, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which provided for minimum wages and maximum hours, the Housing Act, um, relief spending programs, all of these were geared, they thought, to northern constituencies, to, the, to organized labor, to the urban poor, to ethnic minorities, and African Americans. At the local level, county seat elites worried that the New Deal programs threatened traditional patterns of dependency. Rural poverty programs might mean that tenants and sharecroppers no longer depended solely on their landlords for credit. Labor legislation lessened the bonds of dependency or exploitation between employer and worker. Senator Josiah Bailey of North Carolina encapsulated these general conservative concerns in the conservative manifesto he drafted in 1937. That became the touchstone of the bipartisan conservative coalition of Southern Democrats and Republicans that would stymie the extensions of the New Deal for a quarter of a century after 1938. The manifesto was not about race, but Bailey had long-term racial fears. He'd been a leading opponent of Roosevelt's attempt to reform the Supreme Court or to pack the Supreme Court. When he and Car what he and Carter Glass of Virginia feared was what African-American leaders hoped for. Even though the New Deal had left the racial status quo intact, Bailey and Glass feared that the Roosevelt Supreme Court would in the future undermine white supremacy and segregation. And of course, implausible though it seemed at the time, they were right to be afraid. They feared that Northern Democrats would now compete for the votes of African Americans in the Northern cities, and the white South would be in the minority and on the defensive. The passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act and the passage in the House of an anti-lynching bill confirmed their worst fears. When Roosevelt attempted to purge Southern conservative senators in, 1938, in the 1938 Democratic primaries, conservatives explicitly raised the racial issue. Walter George, whose campaign in Georgia was secretly masterminded by the former governor of North Carolina and Roosevelt ally, O. Max Gardner, invoked the specter of reconstruction. Cotton Ed Smith in South Carolina, secretly assisted by Roosevelt's legislative leader, Jimmy Burns, invoked the memory of the red shirts who had restored white rule in South Carolina in the late 19th century. So by 1940, the lines were clearly drawn between the Southern Conservatives and the National Democrats. The, the lines were economic and racial. New Deal reforms threatened the conservative model of economic modernization of the South through attracting low-wage industries to the region. New Dealers potentially threatened the racial status quo. The long, massive resistance was underway. But there was an alternative model of modernization available. The Roosevelt New Deal operated in what Ira Katz Nelson describes as the Southern Cage. Uh, Roosevelt's dependence on Southern congressional leaders and committee chairs prescribed his policy options and inevitably shaped policies like Social Security. When Roosevelt told socialist leader Norman Thomas that he should be patient 
that there was a new generation of Southerners coming up. He was partly looking at young Southern men he saw in Washington. Clark Foreman, Clifford Durr at the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, Brooks Hayes, Beanie Baldwin, and Will Alexander at the Farm Security Administration. Frank Porter Graham, president of the University of North Carolina, who served on his NRA and Social Security advisory boards. Lyndon Johnson, above all, working at the National Youth Administration. Aubrey Williams at the Works Progress Administration. And prominent Southern women, Harriet Elliott, on representing consumers. Ellen Woodward, a significant figure, almost the most important figure in the Works Progress Administration. New Deal relief agencies had first uncovered the full, hitherto unsuspected dimensions of rural poverty in the South. Southerners in the federal agencies in Washington, social scientists at Chapel Hill, pulled that data together in 1938 uh, to label the South the nation's number one economic problem. Their report served as the, as the, as the model, uh, the foundational document for Roosevelt's attempted purge in 1938 and for the formation of the International Southern Conference for Human Welfare. Here was a modernization strategy, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. The key was the creation of mass purchasing power in the South through rural poverty programs, farm tenancy legislation, minimum wage legislation, extended welfare benefits, and the protection of trades unions organizers. Economic democracy would need to go hand in hand with political democracy. Abolishing the poll tax would enfranchise the have-nots in Southern society, lower income voters who would in, in the future support, they believed, New Deal style policy. But Roosevelt could also look to a new generation of congressmen elected in the 30s. They came from the hill country of the South. Lyndon Johnson and Lindley Beckworth in Texas, Albert Gore in Tennessee, John Sparkman in Alabama, Clyde Ellis in Arkansas, all passionate about the TVA, about public power, and about rural electrification. Others came from the southern cities, Albert Thomas in Houston, Estes Kafourfer in Chattanooga, Luther Patrick in Birmingham, Percy Priest in Nashville. They favored New Deal infrastructure projects welfare programs and were, and were relatively close to organized labor. And none of them came from the black belt. They were young. Above all, they were what Spartman used to call TVA liberals. They had faith that the federal government that could transform the South as the TVA had a, a river valley, that the federal government that could transform the river valley could transform the South as a whole. They were issue-oriented rather than patronage-oriented like their predecessors. They espoused a common man appeal to, support the law, to seek the support of lower income voters. Instead of relying on the courthouse gangs, they campaigned tirelessly at isolated crossroads, not just in the county seats of their districts. Uh, to give you uh, just one example from uh, Albert Gore rather than the usual ones from Lyndon Johnson, in 1938, Albert Gore ran for an open seat against five candidates who already held local offices and had name recognition. He crisscrossed his district, no mean task, as it was one of the largest congressional districts east of, the, east of the Mississippi. All the candidates proclaimed their loyalty to the New Deal. How do you distinguish yourself in that group? Well, Gore recognized that in order to, to attract crowds, to pack the rural schools, and to get 2,000 of the meetings at the county seats, he needed more than his speaking ability. He needed to provide some sort of entertainment. So he paid a group of youngsters who would play the guitar and the banjo to sing at meetings, where Albert would join them on the fiddle. Uh, he played an acceptable fiddle, uh, learned at hoedowns in Possum Hollow, uh, Tennessee. Larry Richards, whose father was superintendent of schools in Woodbury, Cannon County, remembered that Gore would, quote, go round to all the little country stores and whatever and get out his fiddle and play it. When Gore went to Woodbury, the word would go out through the county newspaper, and Richards recalled he would stand on the courthouse steps and make a speech, and there would be several hundred people who would gather around the courthouse yard and hear him. In pre-television days, many people who lived out of town did not even have a radio because they did not have any electricity. 
Gore's little road show was a source of entertainment, which would bring out the crowds in Woodbury. Crowds, when he spoke in county towns on Saturdays, ranged from 2,000 to 4,000. In one week, he made 34 speeches to an estimated 20,000 listeners. But it was a, a measure of rural parochialism that the most distinctive issue Gore campaigned on was not the New Deal, but immigration. Gore attacked aliens, the seven to nine million foreigners in the United States, millions being supported by the American taxpayer. They were not schooled in democracy. Rather, they are pursued, of, uh, they're possessed of various concepts of government to which they attempt to convert America. They had taken jobs which should have gone to American citizens. We already have too much unemployment, too many traitors to Americanism. Uh, in reports of his first campaign speech, immigration was identified reporters as his strongest point. In his early days in Congress, he would go on to praise the splendid work of the D's Un-American Activities Committee, lament the fact that American taxpayers supported thousands of foreigners on the WPA rolls, and I was asked why should alien enemies, dope peddlers, prostitutes, criminals, etc., be turned free to promote further debauchery and subversiveness. He made his name in Congress initially attacking spending on public housing, supporting the Dees Committee, and opposing any moves to relax immigration that would allow in those who had served in the Allied armies in World War I. Back in his district, he would celebrate Tennessee's Anglo-Saxon stock, 99.5% native-born, which he believed would offset the unfortunate infiltration of inferior foreign blood in other regions you might be listening to Donald Trump. <laughs> but that provincialism did not stop Gore becoming one of those liberal congressmen from the South over the next 30 years. And he was part of a Southern voting bloc that Ira Katz Nelson has identified as more committed to prov progressive taxation, well pro welfare provision, business regulation, infrastructure spending, and public power than voters in any other part of the country. Uh, these Southerners supported the National Party's social democratic agenda with a level of enthusiasm appropriate to a poor region with a heritage of opposition to big business and a history of support for regulation and redistribution. Devin Coffey at MIT in his new book, came out this week, has noted that one of the first Gallup polls in 1937 asked white Southerners if they had to choose between a conservative party and a liberal party, which would they choose? 67%, 67% in the South chose the liberal party, the highest figure for liberal support of any region in the country. The two issues where Katz Nelson's social democratic Southerners deviated from the national agenda were labor and civil rights. If Southern liberals did not share the hysterical fear of unions that Southern low-wage industrialists manifested, they tended to share a rural, small-town suspicion of outside labor organizers. On race, Southern liberal congressmen simply thought that economic issues were more important. In the Hill Country, there were few African Americans. Albert Gore's mentor, the Smith County Circuit Judge, Clint Beasley, Beasley thought that the South had simply been wrong on the Civil War. In the cities, the, congressman, uh, the liberal congressman viewed African-American voting in local elections with equanimity, and they enjoyed non-threatening relations with African-American college presidents, high school presidents, and members of the small African-American middle class. They believed that the economic measures they supported would yield improvement for both ordinary whites and African Americans. What they did not envisage was any change in racial segregation. In this, they reflected the most advanced thinking within the white South on the race issue. As Morton Sosner and John Kneebone showed some time ago, liberal journalists and academics were committed to a gradual faith that racial relations would change, but the racial change would best come slowly. They also had a paternalistic faith that they knew what African Americans wanted. And what African Americans wanted, they thought, was the continuation of segregation. 
And they also believed that, the, that outside intervention from fe the federal government in racial matters would be counterproductive. It was on the goodwill of whites like these, particularly people in the Commission on Interracial Cooperation, that African-American community leaders had to rely for redress of their grievances. In particular, to protect their appropriations from the onslaught of cost-cutting state legislatures during the Depression. To read the correspondence between James E. Shepard, president of the North Carolina Cong College for Negroes, later North Carolina Central University, and Frank Graham, white president of the University of North Carolina, is to read unremitting obsequiousness on the part of Shepard and equally unremitting condescension on the part of Frank Graham. Frank Graham was one of the most advanced Southern liberals on race, yet there was no level of flattery from black leaders that could embarrass him. He paternalistically accepted it as his due. As Charles Holden has shown in his work on academic freedom at Chapel Hill between the wars, Graham was a courageous and effective uh, defender of academic freedom. But his concern was mainly to fight off the assault of religious fundamentalists in the 1920s and anti-union employers in the 1930s. Civil liberties for Graham meant the defense of radicals, strikers, and labor union organizers, not the defense of advocates for racial change. When Paulie Murray applied to seek admission to the University of North Carolina Law School, Ad Graham was adamant that segregation should be maintained. At the opening meeting of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, where Graham would be the chairman, he proclaimed, Graham proclaimed, the black man is the primary test of American democracy and Christianity. But he warned Murray that to challenge segregation would simply be to drive Southern white racists into the arms of the fascists. It was as inconceivable for these liberals to envisage the end of segregation as it was for the conservatives. The social scientists at Chapel Hill perpetuated the particular limitations of the interwar, uh, interwar interracial movement in the South, described by one weary white observer as, quote, the patronizing approach on the part of whites and the ingratiating appeal from the Negroes. The confessional value of the Negroes bursting with smoldering sense of injustice and the easing of the conscience of the whites, which the whites get from their benevolent gestures. Well, there was a more radical alternative in the South. Pat Sullivan and Glenda Gilmore have brilliantly identified a popular front coalition inspired by the Communist Party's commitment to outright racial equality. Labor, labor union organizers, New Dealers, the NAACP, the Communists, saw local interracial organizing at the workplace, on the plantation, and at the ballot box as the key to racial change. But these dissenters mostly had to leave the South in order to develop their ideas. Their organizations were important to the long civil rights movement, the Southern Tenants Farmers Union, Commonwealth College, the Highlander Folk School, and the Southern Conference for Human Welfare. And many of the people involved in these organizations resurfaced in the 1960s to assist the grassroots organization of the civil rights movement. But they scarcely impacted Southern politicians, either in the States or in Congress, in the 1930s. World War II would challenge that apparent stasis. Historians have long emphasized the double V campaign waged by African Americans during World War II, victory over fascism overseas and over fascism at home. The war gave African American leaders the leverage that they lacked in the 1930s. Manpower shortages enabled African American leaders to make participation in the war effort conditional on concessions by the federal government. Roosevelt, faced with a threatened march on Washington, signed Executive Order 8802, promising to end discrimination, but not segregation, in the military and the defense factories. African Americans joined the NAACP in southern cities and registered to vote. The NAACP won the battle to end the white primary. Migration north 
strengthen the political leverage that African Americans in northern cities could exercise over the National Democratic Party. African Americans who served in the military could be frustrated by the racist abuse they received, but service in the North and overseas raised their expectations of what a non-segregated world might be like. The Army also taught them, as Robert F. Williams would later point out, how to shoot. Southern white liberals argued that curtailing domestic fascists and protecting African Americans was crucial to the full mobilization of resources to defeat Hitler. But liberals were shocked to discover that, quote, what the Negro wants was the end of segregation. Black leaders hitherto considered to be reliably accommodationist made that clear in the Durham Manifesto and in the book, What the Negro Wants, published by a very reluctant University of North Carolina Press. But just as in the 1930s, the long civil rights movement was matched by the long massive resistance, so in the, the African-American double V campaign was matched by a white supremacy double V campaign. No one was more militant in getting America into the war than Southern conservatives. But those conservatives argued that the purpose of defeating Hitler overseas was to demand, defend democracy for whites at home. Democracy at home meant the right to preserve segregation. Said Alabama newspaper editor John Temple Graves, who'd been a noted liberal in the 1930s, uh, the war is a war for states' rights, for the right of individual lands not to be invaded by outsiders, or the right not to be dictated to or aggressed against. Conservatives saw, saw threats to white supremacy and segregation at every turn. These thr threats damaged the war effort, they argued. The Fair Employment Practices Committee was a particular demon. The FEPC, established by Roosevelt's executive order, was in fact led by Southern moderates who bent over backwards to avoid coercive inter intervention in the Southern workplace and to assuage the sensitivities of Southern white workers. Its first chair, Louisville, Louisville uh, newspaper man Mark Etheridge, explicitly said that he could not envisage uh, the end of segregation. But nevertheless, Southern conservatives saw it as a direct federal threat to Southern white, white workers and to traditional Southern racial practices. Richard Russell denounced it as, quote, the most sickening manifestation of the trend that is now in effect to force social equality and miscegenation of the white and black races to force that on the South. William Colmer claimed Hitler in his heyday put through nothing in Germany more vicious than this. Conservatives criticized the behavior of black troops from the North in overcrowded towns near the Southern military bases. They disparaged the quality of African-American troops. They, yet they also bemoaned the fact that whites were drafted from the farms, leaving African-Americans at home. They were appalled at the drive to eliminate the poll tax and the prospect of a federally registered social vote, soldiers vote. They deplored any breakdown of segregation in the military. And finally, they attacked organized labor for its alleged wartime militancy. The result was the abolition of New Deal agencies and the passage of restrictive labor legislation, labor legislation that foreshadowed the anti-union Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 after the war. All of this was justified as part of the white double V campaign. What I've tried to show today is the opening up of the possibilities of racial and economic change between 1933 and 1945, when African-American civil rights have for the first time become part of the national liberal agenda. What I have tried to show is that the Southern white liberal agenda was shaped by a paramount faith that economic change would solve the region's racial problems. Any racial change would have to be gradual. Such change must not challenge segregation. In any case, white liberals, both inside and outside politics, believe that segregation was what African-Americans wanted as well. Federal intervention would be counterproductive. The white South 
needed to solve racial problems for itself. World War II challenged some of those certainties, but that was as nothing to the challenge that the post-war years would bring. The building blocks of that Southern liberal creed uh, were, were demolished. The demand was now for immediate, not gradual racial change. Racial change would be initiated, initiated from outside. In the next lecture, I want to look at how the ineffective those white liberals were to face the challenges of race between 1945 and 1965. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you don't have to, but since you introduced him, you have to wait for the microphone because we're being recorded. Oh. I'll ask the second. All right. <laughs> Maybe the third. <laughs> so during this period, I, I, I am struck, though, by a changing court. I do think the Supreme Court was on a trajectory quite different from the trajectory that we are currently on. And in fact, this is the beginning of that trajectory. And so you have Smith v. Allwright, which is very important case. What is it, 41, I think, for 44. With the, um, and, and I just want to emphasize also that these cases don't really solve the problem because we'd have to wait another 21 years for the Voting Rights Act for it to make. But I mean, but you do see black communities in places like Texas and in South Carolina and in other places really challenging the white primary. And it is frustrating. I mean, as a Democrat in the South, the solid South was democratic. So anybody who's going to be a, a black person who's going to think about the Democratic Party in the South is always in a form of resistance against all these rules about what the Democratic Party actually is. So I, I, I do think that there's a story of um, persistent struggle to win at least in the judicial branch of government from that part of the country. <clears throat> I'm sure you're right, of course. And, um, I, you know, it's going to be ironic that uh, a former Klansman, Hugo Black, would be right, one of the, would be on the Supreme Court uh, and, a and a good guy. People for that and a good guy. And there's no doubt. I mean, this is what Southern conservatives fear. They fear that Roosevelt would appoint to the Supreme Court people who would um, change Southern race relations. And of course, the Warren Court of 1954 was largely made up of people that Roosevelt, to a lesser extent, Truman, but Roosevelt had originally appointed. Um, and it's certainly true that African Americans, uh, the uh, Progressive Democratic Association in South Carolina, um, in New Orleans during the war, you see uh, the NAACP changes its membership from being basically a, a rather a moribund middle class organization to kind of militant working class organization. Uh, so there's plenty, of, there's plenty going on there. Um, but for what, I, what I was trying to get over was how little this impacted on many of the Southern white politicians who were liberals. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it raised the fears of Southern conservatives, mm -hmm. but it was not something that Southern white liberals um, were necessarily going to respond to. What I'm going to argue, point out in the next lecture is really how, um, and it was true really until the 1960s, uh, that Southern liberals who after the war will try and build up biracial <coughs> coalition but they always campaign for the African-American vote at a distance. They, they, they work through intermediaries, um, local ministers and funeral directors and what have you. Uh, the, and, middle, the middle class, yeah. the upper middle class, yeah. right. And, and not directly. Uh, and so, and, and, and a lot of these racial diplomats told them what they thought the white politicians wanted to hear. Uh, and, and as a result, they were shielded from the impatience, all that sort of pent up feeling that was developing in the African American community. The white liberals were shielded from that. Um, what they weren't shielded from was the fury of their white constituents mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and the prospect of racial change. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the reasons that they were so slow to, I think, to, mm -hmm. to take this on board. Mm -hmm. I've just uh, finished. Uh, 
uh, filming a new documentary series about the rise of Jim Crow. It's, really, it's about reconstruction and redemption. Um, but reconstruction is such a short period and the pushback against reconstruction is so long that basically we go from 1863 to 1915. And we end in 1915 because that's the first film about reconstruction, which is the heinous birth of a nation. So it's so I've learned a lot in the last um, two years, really about things I hadn't studied since since um, I was an undergraduate. And Tony, one of the curious things for me is, what, Gut, Gutter Mirdal, 1944, predicted that there would be a civil rights movement. But he said, and you know, when I say he, it was collective. There were a lot of voices subsumed under the name Gutter Myrdal, particularly black scholars at traditionally black universities and colleges. But 10 years later, and that's 1944, 11 years later, there's a Montgomery bus boycott, which is not, I mean, in it he says, the civil rights movement will come, it will come in the North, it will never come in the South. But 11 years later, it comes in, in the South. It's not to say there wasn't uh, Adam Clayton Powell and a zillion other things happening in, in the North. But the movement, qua movement, that we now know as the civil rights movement broke out in the South. So how do you explain that? <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, it's above my pay grade. <laughs> um, I, th I think that what happens is that uh, you have these rising expectations in the African-American community. Mm -hmm. I mean, classically shown in Montgomery, mm -hmm. um, where, where you know, they've been negotiating with us. You know, the, 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 what I call in the next lecture the first system of biracial politics in the South, where you have a small but slowly increasing African-American electorate that has a bit of leverage, particularly in the cities, and it had the, held the balance of power in Montgomery between, um, uh, between the, the factions in Montgomery politics, city mm -hmm. politics. And they elected, or they were res partly responsible for the election, election of one of the commissioners in um, Montgomery, David Birmingham. And so they were negotiating for change. Uh, and time and time again, what they came up was up was against resistance. Mm -hmm. You know, they were they were thinking, you know, we've got this leverage, we'll try to use it, and and the, uh, white simply at the end of the day, particularly after the fifty four decision, white simply wouldn't really contemplate those changes. It's why the Montgomery bus boycott mm -hmm. started by being uh, about um, a, a solution within segregation. I mean, mm -hmm. to provision for equal treatment on the buses, but not the desegregation of the buses. If only the whites in Montgomery had agreed to that, you wouldn't have had a civil rights movement. Right. So it's white intransigence, mm -hmm. uh, rising African ex American expectations coming up against white intransigence. That creates the tension that produces the civil rights movement. Where, where Montgomery links back to what we're talking about today is, of course, uh, um, the first political issue that. Uh, energized Rosa Parks was the defense of the Scottsboro Boys. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and the defense of the Scottsboro Boys was something that, above all, uh, the Communist Party initially had been responsible for publicizing mm -hmm. and taking forward. I would, I would agree, and I would add one, one more thing. You know, there's sort of a, a myth in, you know, it's one of those vague, um, ahistorical myths that all of a sudden black people, that the Great Migration meant all the black people in the South left him and went to the North. Now, there were amazing things that happened because of the Great Migration. One of the most dramatic is the fact that the last Reconstruction Congressman, George White, leaves in 1901. And he gives a brilliant speech about the Negro as a phoenix will rise again. The next black person elected to Congress is Oscar de Priest in Chicago in 1929. Why? Because black people moved to Chicago from the South and were concentrated in um, an area sufficient to elect a congressman again. So it is kind of ironic. But people forget that there is an old black middle class in the South that did not go anywhere. In fact, there were more free Negroes living in the South in 1860 than living in the North. And these people did not go anywhere. And Martin Luther King only left the South to go to BU to get a PhD and then return to the South. So we tend to forget, and plus the role of the church. The church was the, this dynamic institution. Uh, and I've been thinking about a lot because I'm making a documentary film as Ev Evelyn will be my principal consultant on the history of the black church. 
but um, and, and I'm learning a lot, just re reconfiguring my own um, algorithms of blackness. But they, they, there were these solid, continuous institutions that unfolded in the South and developed in historically black colleges. A separate world, but they were very smart people, a class system, an upper middle class, a, a, you know, middle middle class, a professional class, generations of people with college degrees, also generations of people who were sharecroppers. But it was a complicated uh, world, much more interesting than our myths about um, the life of black people the South and the, the wonderful impact that the Great Migration would allow for. I'll make just two quick points. Um, <clears throat> one is that, uh, of course, part of that migration, as you, as you hinted at, of course, part of that migration was within the South, mm -hmm. and it was from the countryside to the southern cities. cities. Right. And it's difficult to imagine a uh, civil rights movement coming out of the rural Absolutely. South yeah. until the 60s. I mean, and that was under very different circumstances. But, it, I mean, the, the, the position of African-American tenants and sharecroppers was so desperate and uh, power, the white power was so entrenched, yes. it's very difficult to see. Whereas in the cities, they had breathing space that mm -hmm. could enable them. And the other is just to be um, a slight, and Evelyn would know much more about this than I do, but uh, it's simply a, a caution about the black church. Um, uh, you know, if, if it had been for the black, if it had been up to the black ministers at Montgomery, you wouldn't have had a bus boycott. Yeah. It was the women, <laughs> um, again, coming from black colleges yes. uh, that drove, forced, the, forced the issue. And of course, the black church was notoriously behind the civil rights movement. That is behind, uh, in, you know, the civil rights movement was in front of the black church in community after community in the, in the South. But on the other hand, Martin Luther King was missing. Mm, yeah. Now, and it was my own, in the North, Reverend Jackson in Chicago hated Martin Luther King. I mean, mm. he changed, Reverend Jackson changed the front entrance to his church. He hated Martin Luther King so much. So after Martin Luther King was assassinated, the church would not be on Martin Luther King Boulevard. <laughs> or track. That's a true story. Right, Evelyn? Evelyn, don't let me talk about no, that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like, no, what, see, what, what, what bothers me is a understanding of the church in one way or the other. So there are lots of different churches. So for example, when they first institute segregation, Can we go see later? in the Thanks turn of the 20th century in Jacksonville, Florida, they are boycotting. In, in Tennessee, the black people are boycotting, then they decide to do their churches, they establish their own trolley car system. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they are, you know, there is a conservative group, and then there is a group that is even in um, a even in the a place like the forties, in some place like Detroit, you have a church that is very conservative before, and then you've got Charles Adams's church, and but it was Charles Hill who was the but minister was like, of, and he was he was, he was the the UAW and for mm -hmm. a he was at the auto workers. Yeah, they're forming there, so the churches themselves are are very complicated, that's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I enjoyed your talk a lot. I guess I want to know more about what, how you understand the status of liberalism in, in your argument. I mean, I think you're illuminating something very important. So for instance, if, if people think of conservative politics as something like school to prison pipelines, maybe um, liberalism is something like not wanting an integrated school system, you know, preferring to keep the best schools for your children, or it could even be like G and T at a school, but meanwhile, low-income Black students are in the sort of special ed program at the same school, right? But in the period you're highlighting, I have a sort of more direct, I like gifted and talented in the oh, same wow. school, but then special ed for other kinds of kids, right? Um, but in the period you're highlighting, I think there's something very important about your argument around sort of paternalism and liberalism, both for domestic policy and and geopolitics, right? Because I think. It's interesting that the liberal stance on, say, something like slavery is that it could and should be ended, but needs to be ended gradually and kind of ushers in an apprenticeship system, right? So not like holding on to slavery as is, but yet not full integration of society. And the geopolitical level is something like a League of Nations mandate system, right? So not like countries being decolonized, but yet not holding on to the colonial order as such. So what I want to know from you is, like, do you think of liberalism as something like 
a project that's progressive and important but doesn't go far enough? Or are you suggesting that it actually ushers in this kind of system that has all these sort of insidious dimensions, right? Like, is it is it actually what allows for um, this sort of idea of tutelage and apprenticeship that makes possible what we think of as like the, a kind of certain kind of growth of inequality? Or do you think of it as something that was dismantling that system, but just not ambitious enough? Cool. Um, <laughs> what, what I think, I mean, I first of all, should say that, that I tend to use the term uh, white liberal in the South and racial moderate in the same term, in the same breath, partly because that's how someone like Hodin Carter III would say that's how it evolved. I mean, that actually, you know, um, white Southern liberals were uh, racial moderates, and increasingly that's how their opponents talked about them. Um, their, their liberalism originally came from their economic liberalism, and then that had spin-offs in terms of what they thought about, about race. In the long-term project, and one of the things I'm going to talk about in the final lecture is the, really the, the way in which the <coughs> education model um, had its limitations. Uh, and, uh, but the, I mean, the one thing that I, I think I'm more impressed with now than I was before I started writing these lectures uh, was that the, the New South governors of the 1970s and 1980s um, really did believe in education, and, and, the, and, the, and the education in the South for both races was pretty appalling. Um, and there, there are dramatic changes in, um, in provision uh, in terms of spending on, on schools and sa teacher salaries uh, and, and, a, and a push for quality. Um, and th this is where the, the drive for economic growth and education go in together because so many of these southern governors would meet, um, would go out on the industry hunting missions right across the world to try and bring industry to, to South Carolina and to Mississippi and the rest of it. And time and time again, they would come up against employers who would say, I, I don't believe that you've got a skilled enough workforce down there for me to come and invest. Uh, and, and so that's why one of the reasons they pushed for this, uh, for this great push on education. Uh, and all education reform in both sides of the Atlantic um, comes up to this question of how do you drive standards up? Uh, and it comes up against, you know, there's a, this, this discussion. James Hunt in North Carolina was unapologetic about, uh, about pushing for tests uh, and teacher accountability, um, and all of the things which which we which liberals on liberal educationalists tend to be very suspicious of. But he was, un, as I said, he was unapologetic. You, you know, we the situation is so bad we have to be doing this. Now, does that have a? How does that affect? Differentially, how does it affect races? Um, uh, undoubtedly, the, the the situation you uh, describe of. African Americans being relegated to certain parts of the school system um, is, is true. On the other hand, what came, came was much better than what had gone before. And, and I think the point which I'm going to end on on, on, on Thursday is that the Republican counterattack um, has, had a, has had a chilling effect uh, on education of both races in the South uh, and the cuts in spending. Um, that the Republicans have, uh, have driven through um, have, have had this chilling effect on education and that, and that it has direct consequences for lower income whites and lower income blacks. Preston Williams. I, uh, you, you've restricted the... No, no, oh. I'm giving it to... Okay. <laughs> <I'm passing> it <laughs> you, you've restricted your topic to um, politicians <laughs> But usually when people think about uh, white the, liberals, they talk, think in terms of... Uh, talk in the mic. Uh, you've restricted your uh, topic to politicians, but usually when people talk about white liberals, they have reference to journalists and to people in uh, literature. And I'm curious as to your views about how the people in journalism and in literature influence the uh, politicians? Uh, was it blank or did they have some effect? And just a comment, if one's going to talk about the uh, civil rights movement and the uh, black church and so forth, 
one needs to uh, study those uh, labor movements and others that uh, Howard Thurman and those were members of, and they were interracial units, and uh, you had a section of those uh, at uh, Howard University, et cetera. So you would have a interracial movement uh, prior to some of these other movements, and there you would pick up your uh, white liberals. <coughs> The, uh, the, the relationship between white journalists, I mean, if I was thinking about the influence on uh, Southern liberals, similar liberal politicians on, of literature, um, I, I think it would, I'd probably say almost nil, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, <laughs> except that they, they, they used to go and talk to Faulkner, um, and uh, that had mixed results, <laughs> depending on whether he was sober or not. Um, but uh, the he was a drunk racist. He was only racist when he was drunk. Uh, <laughs> that, that could be one way of describing it. <laughs> the, um, but in terms of the journalists, it's a very important relationship because, um, and the, the, one of the reasons about why the lib Southern liberal journalists are so important is because they had such influence in the North. So. Um, Northern Democrats would look south and they would look and they would see what, how would they know what was going on in the south? They would talk to Harry Ashmore down in Arkansas or they would talk to Jonathan Daniels in, in Raleigh. Um, and they would talk uh, later on to people like John Siegenthaler down in, at Nashville. Um, on the whole, until the 1950s, those, and uh, Ralph McGill in Atlanta, on the whole, until the 1950s, these journalists. They may, might say in retrospect that they knew Brown was coming, but they didn't let anybody know that at the time. Uh, and uh, they tended to assure the Northerners, um, you know, that they had matters in hand. Uh, and the liberals in the North tended to take them at their word and to believe that what liberals in the North must not do is to undercut the position of white moderates in the South by being too demanding. Um, and what's striking about, uh, about liberals in the North, Hubert Humphrey was a bit of an exception, but what's striking about liberals in the North in the 1950s was how cautious they were on civil rights, uh, and particularly how reluctant they were, for instance, to demand enforcement of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, so I think there's this, there is this symbiotic relationship between Southern liberals, journalists, and Northern politicians. And the irony, and I'll make the point next time, the irony is that that meant that the one argument that Southern liberals could have used in the 1950s, which was, like it or not, this is going to happen. Um, because the, the North, is, I mean, the federal government and the courts are going to insist on it, was actually, um, they couldn't use that argument because the North wasn't insisting on it. And the reason the North wasn't insisting on it was because they listened to these liberal journalists. Um, and, and backed off, I think. Brandon. Uh, so I, I feel like um, just following a little bit on these, uh, these questions that are prodding about the liberalism. Um, so I'm trying to think of another way of going at it. So you might think, you know, coming, coming out of political theory, I mean, what we would probably just say is, well, these people aren't liberals. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's a political scientist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and so, but but one other way that and I and I'm and I'm trying to track exactly what you mean here um, is that you might also think of the 1930s as the crucial moment in the United States for a debate about what liberalism is going to mean. Uh, and so you've got Dewey, liberalism and social action. You've got these these debates around. Uh, you know, as, as Preston was bringing up, these, these debates about does civil disobedience have a place in liberalism, um, or is that a, a method of coercion that kind of overflows the boundaries of it? And so, I mean, I know you're not necessarily dealing with uh, kind of high theorist of the liberal project, but I, I do wonder if they're, um, because they, they, they do straddle a weird line, and is the, is the, is the point of emphasis is, is there trouble with the race question ultimately one 
about um, that, that that has a deeper significance for the history of liberalism writ large, right? Are they contributing some peculiar version of what liberalism might mean uh, in this constellation of debates at this period? <clears throat> I have to confess that the British historians of American history um, and American studies were once uh, condemned by a, a very good friend of mine, Richard King, who's a distinguished Southern intellectual history historian, by saying that British uh, academics were, quote, tone deaf to theory. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'd probably have to plead guilty <laughs> to that charge. Um, <clears throat> but as far as, you see, I see the debate on liberalism in the 30s as being a very different one. I see it, it, it as, as being about, for the first time, the federal government was assumed to have a responsibility um, for the social welfare of ordinary Americans, and that it, it that it they, you couldn't simply rely on the market, and you had to rely on federal government. I mean, you had to rely on government intervention. Sometimes that was. I mean, the debate on liberalism was really how far should that intervention go? Uh, and in the 30s, um, with the Wagner Act and uh, Social Security, it was going a long way. Um, in some way, in some cases. Even, you know, ideas that were even more advanced than that on planning and the rest of it. Um, it tended to get restricted in time to be, this is about government spending. Uh, compensatory Keynesianism, as people describe it, rather than social Keynesianism. Um, but in the 30s, you know, the, it, was, it was a remarkable decade for that. It was a remarkable decade. It was a, it was a decade when the most, you have the most you know, when politics has the most radical cutting edge in terms of class politics, um, it's a decade when it's almost impossible to imagine any other year than 1935 when the Wagner Act could have passed a, an American Congress. Some, a piece of legislation that's so restricted, so one-sided, so restricted the rights of employers uh, and in, you know, enforced the rights of workers. Uh, it, it, it virtually, I can't imagine another Congress that would have passed that. Even Lyndon Johnson's Great Society people couldn't have passed that sort of legislation. So that's why I see this debate about liberalism going on. And these Southern liberals were enthusiastic for that stuff. Um, where they were less certain was on this question of how did this, how do you translate that into racial terms? And when those Chapel Hill social scientists did brilliant dissections uh, of um, particularly of, of sharecropping and lynching uh, and the economic consequences and if, effects of that. Um, but in, but, but they, two things. First of all, although they, they worked with African-American social scientists, uh, they, it was very much on their own terms. And they, they had a view that only whites really could sort these problems out. And all, running through it is this sense of, quote, the Negro problem. Yeah. And it was a Negro problem, not for Negroes. It was a Negro problem for white. Uh, and, and so that's where the, the, the leap between what they were believing in economic terms and what the consequences of those policies ought to be for African Americans. It's where the disconnect, the disjunction, I think, takes place. Thank you um, for this uh, poignant talk. I'm going to stay in my lane, as I usually say, as a musicologist here. Uh, it's easy to do because music is connected to every part of culture, including our political cultures. Uh, but there is something very interesting to me about your description and sort of uh, honing in on, uh, on Albert Gore and this touring with you know banjo, fiddle, guitar, uh, because this is not, this definitely wasn't the first time that this was happening in our political landscape. We have Andrew Jackson, who sort of really helped his rise to populism, was also heavily through blackface minstrelsy. Uh, specifically, like the topics that were performed on stage traveled throughout the North, throughout the South, as well as like actual participants. Those who were like over Christie's minstrels, like the folks who uh, were managing these teams were like also directly supporting and writing uh, in support of, uh, of, of these, of, of, of Jackson and, and, and colleagues. Uh, and then I also think of uh, Bill Clinton playing the saxophone uh, on Arsenio Hall, right? Uh, so there is something interesting to me about this uh, the political usage of, so, and, and I think you're also very right to point out that, I mean, blackface entertainment was the first sort of form of American popular music and also persisted, well, until today, uh, <laughs> but openly, you know, through the 1950s or so. 
Um, and so to think about, you know, Birth of a Nation, but particularly the way that this idea of, um, I mean, what you described was sort of a bluegrass, early bluegrass combo, uh, but bluegrass coming directly in relation to these sort of minstrel performances of banjo and of fiddling, right? Um, and so there, there's, there's so much bound in uh, the use of these cultural performances as political moments as well, or to sort of raise the way that we think about politics. I don't know if I have a question, but I'm just, I'm thinking, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about the connection between these things and what you might think even further about sort of the use of those particular instruments and their meaning in this moment, uh, in particular in relation to Albert uh, Gore. <coughs> Albert, in, in Albert's case, um, one of the things that his wife insisted was that he give up playing the fiddle on the campaign trail because it wasn't, it wasn't senatorial. <laughs> when he ran into real problems in 1970, he brought the fiddle out again. <laughs> um, but, uh, the, the, and the other thing was that, um, I mean, in Tennessee, of course, you know, country and Western singers play a large part in, in politics. Roy Acuff ran for uh, governor in 1948, uh, Tex Ritter, ran for the Republican nomination for the Senate in 1970. Uh, in, in all these cases, they got tremendous audiences for their campaign rallies, but not the votes <laughs> that went, went with them. Uh, and, um, and William Brock, who opposed Albert Gore, and defeated Albert Gore in 1970, complained to me that he said that uh, Johnny Cash um, had endorsed him but it also endorsed Tex Ritter, Ritter, who opposed him in the primary. So, and, he's, and, he's, and, he, and Cash couldn't really see any contradiction in this, <laughs> Oppose, uh, endorsing both candidates. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the, the, one of the arguments has always been, of course, that the country and Western music is essentially conservative in, in terms of its concentration, I mean, concentration on particular sorts of values, um, militaristic on the whole. Um, and, uh, and certainly in the 1960s, on the whole, country and Western singers endorsed George Wallace. Um, that probably, well, apart from Jimmy Davis, um, who I, I, I always remind you is governor of Louisiana twice, um, and, but it came to fame, had come to fame running uh, as, a, as a cowboy musician on, on, in B-movies in the 1930s. That was also a history graduate. Um, but uh, of course, he, Jimmy Davis uh, composed You Are My Sunshine. Mm -hmm. uh, and You Are My Sunshine became uh, record. I mean, the, the, almost no song has been covered as often yeah. as You Are My Sunshine. Well, Jimmy Davis liked to portray himself as this sort of person who said, um, you know, music was the great leveler, or at least the great pe peacemaker. You couldn't play the guitar and fight at the same time, he argued. Uh, and, but, but he was a segregationist governor. Yeah. And when, when the, they tried to desegregate the schools in New Orleans in 1970, Jimmy Davis was governor and did everything he could to try and interpose the state of Louisiana and the federal government. Um, so uh, in the end, on the whole, when, uh, as far as country music is concerned, I think that probably the conservatism rather than its liberalism is what, what comes out most. Okay, final question before we have reception. Are you got a microphone? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe just give two. Oh, cool, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. I just want to get back to the most recent events, as you have a time frame there, close to 2018, and, and highlight two races that are really getting a lot of attention, uh, one in Florida for the governorship, as well as the one in Georgia. Uh, where you have two the black female versus a male, uh, a white male, and then the black male versus a white male. And uh, both of the males are trumpets, are really, you know, very, very powerful uh, voices of the Trump administration, so to speak. And, and I wonder how you see that uh, from your angle uh, in looking at white leaders in, in that context. <coughs> I, I mean, I, I, one of the points. Uh, that I make in the final lecture is, is, you know, Doug Wilder, elected governor of Virginia in 1989, um, is still really the only, you know, African-American politician elected to a statewide Senate or governor's seat, except for Tim Scott in South Carolina. And that was, that South Carolina election was very, he was, he became an incumbent by, he was appointed to the Senate seat and then was an incumbent. And that's very much, a very different sort of business. When Wilder rang in 1989, 
Um, every, the polls showed him six points ahead, right up to the election. Uh, and he was backed by a lot of old-fashioned conservative uh, bird machine Virginia politicians. Um, uh, and he ran a very moderate campaign. And yet, he only just won. Um, in the polls showing the races between Harvey Gantt and Jesse Helms, same sort of thing. Uh, at, at, the polls had them tied. Helms won by 6%. So there is, I know people call it the Bradley effect, but I mean, I think there is this, um, uh, there is this southern version of the Bradley effect is that you have to, be, an African-American candidate probably has to be 6% ahead in the polls just to, to just win. And that's what makes, gives me pause about what's going to happen in Florida uh, with Andrew Gillum as to whether, you know, at the end of the day, he's been making inroads in, in, in suburban white districts, which Democrats generally have been failing to do in this election round in the South. Um, so that, that, that's promising. Um, but, uh, you know, I'd be, I, I, wouldn't put my, I wouldn't bet my house on Gillum winning. And I think even more so in Georgia. Again, despite the fact that it's a, uh, a state which has all sorts of, um, you know, potential for the Democratic Party there, I just be, uh, I think the, uh, I don't see it happening for Stacey Abrams, especially after this recent controversy over the, burn, uh, you know, the burning the Confederate flag. Right. Uh, you know. One more. I can ask it afterwards. Um, no, go ahead. This will be the last question. Quick question, quick answer, because we're, we have a, a time, which is, we always have reception after each of the lectures, but your lecture coincides with the opening of our um, next exhibition at the Cooper Gallery downstairs. So we will all remove. Okay. <laughs> 102 Mount Alden Street uh, for food and drink and art. Uh, so last yeah, question. I'll be quick. So you mentioned the uh, birth of this uh, scholarship on, on lynching. Uh, in Chapel Hill, I think mm -hmm. Arthur Raper's Tragedy of Lynching, the Commission on Interracial Cooperation. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about why this analysis in James Chadbourne's Lynching the Law, which pointed out the economic disadvantages of lynching, why this wasn't more persuasive for uh, the white liberals you discussed. Like what, like what, if you can talk me through what, just why this, the, the, this didn't res resonate with them, and you see that with Costick and Wagner bill not yeah. making it through the Senate. Uh, uh, time and again, like, like Commission on Interracial Co Cooperation, um, uh, Jacqueline um, Dow uh, Dowd Hall's book on Jesse Daniel Ames, um, you know, here was you know, a courageous uh, campaign against lynching and yet still opposed to federal anti-lynching legislation. Yeah. And it was that federal intervention all the time that they were hostile to. People like Raper. Um, did get radicalized. I mean, not radicalized is the wrong word, but they did. They did move far more into the, the orbit of Washington, uh, and uh, on the whole, white Southerners who went to Washington and got involved with New Deal agencies did become much less committed to this gradualist um, pro-segregation philosophy, uh, and that's one of the um, one of those. Uh, and, 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 and some of them went to work for Murdoch. Part of that, along with the, the African American social scientists, some of those Chapel Hill people went to work for Murdoch, and they had they they moved on in a way that the people in Chapel Hill didn't. Let's thank Tony Baggett for.